the Amazon is really big. It doesn't look as big as you might realize when you look at the map. But if you remember that the Mercator projection exaggerates the size of everything away from the equator, and then you realize, of course, at the equator it doesn't exaggerate at all. So it's actually the size of the 48 contiguous United States, which I wanted you to have in mind when I mentioned that one of the interesting quirks of Amazon history is that the first time a non-indigenous group traveled the length of the Amazon, uh, it was actually in 1541 uh, when a barely 30-year-old young conquistador named Francisco de Oriana set out from Quito with Pizarro's half-brother and went up and over the Andes and down into the green of the Amazon in search of cinnamon and gold. Of course, he found neither. Uh, but in the end, he took a group of 57 men and kept going down river because each time they came to a junction with the new river, it was bigger than the one before. And about two thirds of the way down the river, they encountered what they thought were Amazon women warriors. And that's how actually the river got its name. Uh, it also almost discredited the whole expedition because everybody thought it was very fanciful. But it appealed to the King of Spain who put the, the name on the river. Uh, it was also clearly at that time in 1541, uh, very generously populated. They were almost never without a uh, view of another village along the banks of the Amazon. Uh, and they obviously had highly developed uh, civilizations, uh, ways of making a living in the Amazon. And much of that vanished with the arrival of European diseases. So for the longest time, uh, the Amazon was actually thought to be an area which indigenous people had not had large populations in. But we now know uh, going back, uh, not only reading the accounts of that expedition, but also looking at other evidence, uh, is that there were considerable populations, many millions of Amazon Indians in communities uh, throughout the basin. So they obviously had spent a lot of time uh, figuring out ways to make a living uh, in that environment. Uh, and they even traded cacao, which is native to the Amazon. So anytime you have some chocolate, think of the Amazon. Uh, they traded cacao out beyond the Amazon itself so that it had actually gotten all the way to Mexico uh, by the time that Western explorers had reached there. So I got to the Amazon a little bit later, right? I got there in 1965, and basically the Amazon was 97% intact, and there were about five million Let's see, no, there were about 10 million people in the entire Amazon. Uh, and there was not a lot of economic activity. Uh, exports of Brazil nuts, which grow in the forest, 
uh, and depend on a particular bee species to pollinate them. Uh, and that bee species needs other tree species to depend on during the months of the year the Brazil nut is not in flower. Uh, so it does not grow successfully in plantation form. So every Brazil nut that you've ever uh, eaten has actually been harvested out of the Amazon forest. Uh, so the next biggest export to come out of the Amazon, of course, was rubber. But the Indians had already discovered rubber uh, but the process of vulcanization was unknown, and so you couldn't make things like bicycle tires or automobile tires uh, until Goodyear did an experiment uh, in his kitchen, much to the disgust of his wife, I imagine mixing it up with sulfur and spilling some accidentally on the stovetop and discovering the process of vulcanization. Uh, so once you could have rubber that was properly hardened and, and seasoned uh, and could be made into things like uh, automobile tires, uh, rubber became a highly sought after a commodity around the world, and, and all of it came out of the Amazon. So it actually was a place of enormous wealth. The city of Manaus was the first city in all of South America to have electric street lights. Uh, and they might have maintained that monopoly had not Henry Wickham uh, in correspondence with the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, realized that this was something really very interesting to uh, scientists at a place like Kew, which was the center of economic botany. Uh, and he managed to arrange for a shipment of rubber tree seeds to go to UK uh, in the late 19th century, uh, and they in turn, uh, 20, 30 years later, became the basis for the plantation rubber in Southeast Asia. Uh, and that's because in the Amazon, uh, rubber trees grow in isolation from one another to avoid natural diseases. Uh, in Malaysia, they don't have those natural diseases, so they can grow them in plantation form. and Therefore, the rubber is considerably cheaper, and they pulled the rug out from under uh, the Brazilian rubber industry. Uh, so when I got to the Amazon, 1965, it was 97 percent intact, and uh, they had just built the first highway from Belang to Brasilia, Belang being the port city. Uh, and everybody was remarking with enormous surprise about the spontaneous colonization along the highway. Uh, and that sort of foreshadows one of the big problems of infrastructure in the Amazon which is, by and large, it's, it's not the impact of the actual infrastructure itself. Uh, it's what it makes possible. Uh, but we'll get back to that later. Uh, so the Amazon probably is most famous for, and appropriately so, uh, the amount of biological diversity that it holds in its forests and its rivers. Um, and I remember, you know, looking down from a tower at the Amazon forest and realizing I'd never seen so many shades of green in my life. And 
if you have access to the April National Geographic magazine, there's actually a photograph of that, of that tower, uh, which was used to actually do insect collecting and find all kinds of new species of insects which were living in the forest alongside that tower. So it's such a good example in itself of the richness of species uh, in these forests and how far we have to go to actually learn about it. Uh, we know the birds pretty well. We even know the trees pretty well and the mammals and the butterflies and the fish. But beyond that, we don't know a lot about that incredible biodiversity. Uh, it's, without any question, it is the largest repository of biodiversity on the face of the planet. Uh, and it's always full of surprises. Uh, and one that I remember back when I was a graduate student uh, netting birds down near the mouth of the Amazon was uh, netting a little bird one day, which was quite distinctive and handsome, a uh, flycatcher uh, with sort of russet and black and white. And we couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, and I thought, well, this is so distinct we can just photograph it and band it and let it go. Uh, and then from the, from the photograph, we'll be able to identify it later. Well, it took years. And it took years because that flycatcher had never been known within hundreds of miles of where I was working until somebody, one day somebody caught it who actually knew what it was. Uh, and one of the people who had been working with me at the time said, oh, that's the one we couldn't identify, right? Uh, so little surprises like that happen all the time. So the biodiversity is also considerable in the rivers. You're really talking about 20% of all the river water in the world. Uh, probably 3,000 species of fish and rivers that go up and down as much as 10 meters every year uh, and flood the adjacent forests and they get flooded forests and species which live only in flooded forests. So approximately 20% of the Amazon actually is a wetland except you wouldn't know it because a large part of that wetland is actually forest. Uh, and one of the really cool things is there are fish species that take advantage of that, that flood time and go into the forest and basically do their major feeding of the year in the forest. Uh, essentially taking advantage of, of the terrestrial uh, productivity. Uh, so there's one that eats big palm nuts. Uh, there's another one that scrapes algae off the tree trunks. Uh, it's a fascinating bit of natural history uh, that is pretty close to something you only see in the Amazon itself. So yes, there are 3,000 species of fish. Some do what I was just describing. Others are some of the most beautiful aquarium fish that we all think about, like angelfish or neon tetras. Uh, and they're also really large catfish, many species, in fact which have life cycles which take them from the estuary all the way up to the headwaters and back in their life cycle. 
Uh, so it is a f fascinating place biologically in, in the freshwater systems as well as uh, in the forest uh, systems on drier land. So in about the mid-1960s, a think tank called the Hudson Institute issued a report in which they put forth the idea that the entire Amazon should be flooded and create a gigantic lake in the middle of South America uh, with purported access uh, to minerals in the northern Amazon, which could then be shipped across the lake to go to the, to the south of the country. Uh, and most of us at the time just dismissed it uh, as a really wacko idea. And it was a wacko idea. I mean, if you actually could achieve it, it would change the rotation of the planet. Uh, uh, you know, just like a ballet dancer when they they put out their arms, it changes changes the rate at which they spin around. Uh, but one of the things that came from that uh, was that the Brazilian military were about the only ones who took the report seriously, uh, and they. Their reaction was, this says to us that if we don't exert our presence in the Amazon, somebody's going to take it away from us. And that, that gave birth to a, a whole array of infrastructure projects, um, <clears throat> highways, uh, hydroelectric projects uh, throughout the Amazon. Uh, some of which are never actually came to fruition, but don't go away as ideas uh, and get brought back and breathe new life into uh, and go under construction from time to time. Uh, so the big problem with all these infrastructure projects uh, is not so much the impact of the actual project, uh, but what it makes possible. And basically, it provides access to the forest, uh, which otherwise would not be available at all. So uh, the, the amount of deforestation that occurs, uh, a lot of it Ill illegally, is along these uh, highway projects that I think need a serious redesign uh, from a sustainability lens. So for example, you could build one of these highways as an elevated highway. Uh, the economics of it is probably equivalent to a standard highway because standard highways require an incredible amount of maintenance and something which is entirely concrete uh, requires very little. Uh, and Brazil has actually done one of those uh, called imigrantes in the state of Sao Paulo. So I think there's some interesting things that can be done by looking at how can these infrastructure projects uh, be redesigned from a sustainability perspective. Uh, how can you redesign some of the hydroelectric projects so that they don't block the entire river flow and the sediment flow from the Andes and the migratory uh, pathways of those catfish? Uh, and sometimes you don't even need to build infrastructure. It's right there as natural infrastructure. Uh, so some years ago when Bungi was growing soybeans south of the Amazon 
uh, and looking for a way to ship it up to the Amazon and out uh, to the Atlantic, uh, the head of Bungie just finally decided, you know, the best way to do this is just to use the rivers. They've always served as highways. Uh, let them serve as a highway this time, and then there will be no problem of spontaneous colonization and deforestation. Uh, so today, compared to 1965, 20% of the Amazon is deforested. And the, the annual deforestation rate uh, has proved uh, quite persistent. The figures for May uh, 2021 are the worst ever for May. Um, and that, more than anything, is a lack of investment in enforcement. Uh, and that means, in the end, uh, it's possible to do something about this. It's just a matter of resources and political will. Uh, so when you add all this up together, uh, what we need to do is think about the Amazon and how it works as a system with 30 million people today. Uh, but also, quite remarkably, compared to 1965, close to 50% protected either as traditional conservation areas or as demarcated indigenous reserves, uh, something that I think nobody would ever have dreamed possible. Uh, uh, is it impressive? Yes. Is it enough? No. And part of the, the, the reason to be concerned about that relates to the ability of the Amazon to make half of its own rainfall. Uh, we don't tend to think about plants and trees from that perspective. Uh, it's true almost anywhere, uh, but it reaches its ultimate expression uh, in the Amazon rainforest. And back in the 1970s, a Brazilian scientist named Anaya Salati uh, looked at the isotope ratios of oxygen in rainwater he had, had collected from the, the Atlantic all the way to the Peruvian border. And by looking at those ratios, he was able to demonstrate very clearly uh, that the Amazon was literally recycling that water five or six times. The Amazon's ability to make its own moisture is incredibly important. And, you know, at the time I remember talking with Aeneas about, well, how much deforestation would cause that hydrological cycle to degrade. And incidentally, you, you can see it with the naked eye. Uh, you know, after a rainfall, there, there are plumes of moisture which go up out of the top of the forest, moving westward and forming rain farther to the west and recycling once again. Uh, so at the time, we thought that maybe 40 or 50 percent deforestation in the Amazon could cause that hydrological cycle to degrade. Uh, but nowadays we know there are additional factors in, in, impinging on all of this, uh, one of which uh, is the extensive use of fire and the other is climate change. And we can see that the Amazon, in fact, is close to a tipping point in which that hydrological cycle uh, will not be furnishing as much rain to central Brazil 
uh, and indeed in the Amazon itself, particularly in the south and east, uh, where the vegetation could convert to savanna, uh, releasing a lot of carbon, uh, obliterating a lot of biodiversity, affecting the people that live there. Uh, but we also know that that hydrological cycle benefits more than just the Amazon. It benefits central Brazil. In fact, that moisture contributes to every country in South America except for Chile. So it is critical to secure the hydrological cycle for a sustainable future uh, for essentially much of South America uh, and the biological resources that occur there. Uh, and we now believe uh, Carlos Nobre, uh, Brazil's noted climate scientist, uh, and I believe the tipping point is around 20%, pretty close to where it is right now. And we can already see changes in the dry season in the southern and eastern Brazil being longer and hotter, seeing changes in the kinds of tree species which are growing, uh, all first signs of the tipping point. Uh, so the good news is that reforestation can restore a lot of the capacity to generate moisture for the hydrological cycle. Uh, and we can back off from that tipping point uh, and have a sustainable Amazon and a sustainable, sustainable hydrological cycle uh, for South America as a whole. So looking forward, what are some of the things we need to think about to actually have a sustainable Amazon? Of course, Enforcement is on the list, right at the top of the list. Uh, but when you start thinking about managing the Amazon as the system that it is, uh, we need to have a way to keep track of the state of the hydrological cycle. Uh, we need to have organized ways to explore the biodiversity of the Amazon and its potential to bring all kinds of human benefit. And one of the lesser known stories about that, which is already, which already exists, uh, involves the ACE inhibitors, which hundreds of millions of people take every year to control their high blood pressure. And that's all based on the biology of a very effective viper, the fair to loss, which lives in those forests. And when it bites, bites a mammal, it causes its blood pressure to go to zero forever. Well, you might wonder, you know, what's the worth of that? Uh, well, in fact, it involved the whole system of regulation uh, a blood pressure that had not been known by science before, the angiotensin system. And once that was recognized, pharmaceutical chemists at the Squibb Company were able to develop the first of the ACE inhibitors, which all these people use to live longer and healthier lives, oblivious to the fact that they should be thanking the Amazon every day. Uh, so there needs to be a way to systematically uh, explore the living library that the biodiversity of the Amazon represents and maybe do it in a way that can benefit all the Amazon countries, uh, not just a single one. We need to convert the whole way of thinking about infrastructure to sustainable infrastructure, as we were discussing before. Uh, and we 
need to develop what Carlos Nobre and I are call and others are calling the bioeconomy. Uh, so a really interesting example would be uh, some of the fish in the Amazon, uh, including the ones that swim into the floodplain forest. They're actually delicious. Uh, they also are very good in aquaculture. Uh, there has been some aquaculture done at scale here and there in the Amazon, but there's absolutely no reason that that can't be brought up to a scale where it's a major export uh, economic activity benefiting the Amazon uh, with these fish species, which could become as well known as cod or salmon uh, in the future. Uh, so we need to look at that. Uh, we need to be imaginative about sustainable cities. Uh, Manaus is an interesting example, although a bit of an exception because it benefits from an economic free zone. And so most of the employment in Manaus actually involves uh, assembly plants, uh, which use materials not from the forest, but from elsewhere in Brazil. Uh, like the largest Harley-Davidson factory in the world uh, and computer boards and uh, similar kinds of products for cell phones. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of thought around uh, sustainable activities, economic activities for cities. Um, and I guess I hadn't even mentioned tourism. Tourism is, has just barely scratched the surface in the Amazon. Uh, and there are, also, there are also a couple international Amazonian organizations. Uh, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty, based in Brasilia, and the Leticia Pact, based in Colombia, uh, which could serve as vehicles to coordinate this kind of uh, approach to the future. Uh, and a new initiative just starting by the Inter-American Development Bank called the Sustainable Amazon Initiative, uh, which amongst other things looks for ways to promote the bioeconomy uh, and bring the sustainable development of the Amazon to the attention of finance ministers, not just environment ministers. So that's a bit of a saga about the largest repository of biodiversity on Earth. Uh, one of the major stores of carbon on the planet, which is incredibly important for climate change, but that's just one of the values of the Amazon. Uh, and I think those of us who work on it see this potential not only as essential for the future of the environment in South America, uh, the future of biodiversity on the planet, uh, but also uh, a wonderful sort of working experiment that could create ideas that can benefit uh, the environmental future elsewhere in the world. Thank you.